I hear a bird. All right, we're live. Yes. Welcome to Dive into World Building. And um, today we have a returning guest. And I, I always love to see returning guests. This is Henry Lien. Hi, Henry. Hi, back. Okay. So um, Henry is awesome. And the last time we had you on the show, uh, we were talking about a bunch of your work. But um, but I noticed that we were talking about the uh, Pearl Rehabil Rehabil Rehabilitative Colony for Ungrateful Daughters, which... Yes. Um, was a really, really cool story and seems r related <laughs> to um, perhaps to your to your novel that's just coming out. And the novel is, uh, why don't you tell us about your novel? The novel is the direct sequel to Pearl Rehabilitative Colony for Ungrateful Daughters. And that was a story, a novelette that came out in Asimov in December of 2013. And it was, um, I don't know. I guess I kind of described it as a female fight club because I wrote it for <laughs> Chuck Palahniuk at Clarion West. And it was about, it was a fantasy second, set in the secondary world that was a, focused on an invented form of art or sport that combined figure skating with kung fu. And the, the genesis of it was, there were a number of things, but one of the things is that because Chuck Palahniuk was the, the, uh, the person mentoring me on this story, I was looking at his most iconic work, Fight Club, and the Fight Club isn't about action. It's about it's about male on male relationships, and he's also really great with voice. So I wanted to do something that stepped very far outside of my own experience as an exercise in empathy and um, and as a test of my own powers of ventriloquism. And so, as a middle aged uh, gay man with a receding hairline. I thought, well, why don't I try to why don't I try to enter the world of of uh, teenage girls and try to understand a set of teenage girls and 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 explore girl on girl dynamics in a in a very claustrophobic setting, a very high pressure setting, and which was it, the setting was a sort of um, penal colony cram school for talented but misbehaving girls, so that they could shape up for an entrance examination into a prestigious academy where they would pursue their studies further if they would just get their act together. And so that was the, that, was that uh, novelette. And this novel, and the novel is, a, is the first of a series, this novel is the direct sequel to that. So it switches viewpoint and it switches schools, but it's many of the same characters, same world, and um, expanding the, the, the world far greater than the uh, initial thought experiment of trying to do um, a female fight club. And so the if I had to describe the novel, but I'm just gonna crib what everybody seemingly says. They all, they all say it's Harry Potter meets Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon on ice. And that's, very, that's actually very appropriate on a surface level. But as I dug deeper in, into the story, it became very much about a couple of things. It became about immigration, uh, about crossing cultures, about divided identities about how coming from one country to another, uh, let me back up a little bit. The main character is a girl who comes from a, a fairly rural but vast empire with a long history. And she comes to an island that is wealthier, more technologically sophisticated, and more, in her eyes, more culturally advanced. So she's very much a, a it's very much her immigrant experience. And the book becomes about how how one how one's identity splits in two when one crosses an ocean when one begins that journey of immigration mm -hmm. and how one tries to harmonize those two split identities and and use that as a great advantage and i and i specifically set it in a fantasy world that was very different from any fantasy world I had read, so that everybody would be lost in this world. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's not a that's not, I didn't invent that. I mean, that's a very common technique. But it was meant to be bewildering, even though on the surface it seems familiar in some ways. There are definite definite cultural markers. It draws heavily from the uh, complicated history among China, Taiwan, and Japan, and the mm -hmm. and the, the competition among them, and the way that um, the way that cultures neighbors colonists and colonialized cultures interact with each other and, and infect each other. Um, so there are lots of markers that suggest 
that it's grounded in history, but then there are these huge departures so that you think on first um, impression, okay, this is, I, I know this, but then once you get into some of the very specific aspects of daily life in the culture, you, you, you are as lost as anybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, I, see, I, I see that Khalida uh, made a mention about parakeets. The, one example of the world building in the world is, uh, this, this shows you how different it is from actual experience, is the way that newspapers are, are delivered. There is a, a system where newspaper headlines for the tabloids are delivered via birds. And the birds are modeled, and the birds and their behavior are modeled on my own birds because wherever I go in my house, they follow me. And I realize, okay, well, if, if they follow me everywhere and my writing in this world is a sort of script that, it, that is a continuous line, like Chinese calligraphy, mm -hmm. I could conceivably make them follow me around and trace out words in the sky. And so that's how they deliver, their, that's how this tabloid delivers their headlines. They're, they've got somebody go, skating around and pointing up and, 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 uh, and the birds are circling in the sky above and with an, at the hand, they're basically doing calligraphy with the birds in the sky. And that is, that is something that is, that is based on, you know, based on Chinese calligraphy, particularly something called grass style calligraphy, which looks like, blades of grass caressing each other. It's very, very fluid. So it can be done. Here's an example of grass, callig grass star calligraphy. Can you see, can you see that? Can you, can you see the, the scroll? The, the calligraphy yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is very, very fluid. They, they, all the lines bleed into each other in a way that you would not see in printed script. So I took that, that's an actual cultural thing. And then I took my birds and their actual, their actual um, behavior and then marry them in a way so that even their headlines are delivered in a way that is alien to everybody. And so that was how I approached the world building, using film, familiar blocks and combining them in ways that were unfamiliar, the way that I took figure skating and kung fu and looked for natural intersections between them to come up with something that was new. I don't remember what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think this actually relates to the, the question that was suggested earlier about how being a bird person changed your perspective on your world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> that, is one, that is one way. <clears throat> I did not go, I did not seek to adopt these birds, but um, they were rescues like most of my animals. And um, they're, they're little, but they're parrots and they act like parrots. And I realized that parrots are this really this alien race that we share this earth with their personalities. I mean, I, um, I, I know some people who have PTSD and I know at least one person who has autism spectrum and all parrots exhibit behaviors that are reminiscent of that in that they are very, very sensitive to their environments. Their triggers are consistent, even if they're um, mysterious to us. I don't know why when I approach my birds from this angle, they freak out and they and their eyes flash and dilate. And when I approach them from this angle, they're loving and sweet and want to give me kisses. But those triggers are very consistent. So um, having these birds, I don't, and, I, and even though they were restless, I don't think that they were abused because I've met other parrots and they're just, they're all just as idiosyncratic. And so it made me, it made me learn to love something that I don't fully understand and probably will never fully understand. And that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful lesson um, as a person, as a writer, as a world builder. How do you appreciate the nooks and crannies of a psyche, of a world, of another person's experience, even if you can't fully understand it? How can you bring as much heart to the table as possible, even if you will never be able to see the world entirely from the viewpoint? So that's, that's kind of what I got from having birds. Um, they really helped me become a better person and a better writer in some ways. Cool. I'm, I'm writing like crazy over here. <laughs> oh, I forgot you, you do a summary. Yeah, I do, I do. And, and, and hopefully it will not take me two months to get it up on the, on the, on the website, but, but we'll see. Um, I'm slowly, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. 
Uh, but if I if I delay just slightly, then that's why. <laughs> I want to ask about ice skating. Okay, let's ask about ice skating. Do it. Ask about ice skating. What about ice skating, Henry? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, mostly because um, apparently there's this giant group of of figure skating editors and writers and genre that I had no idea about until I accidentally joined it. Oh yeah, I yeah. didn't know that either. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I have people following my my ice figure skating class exploits. So um, sure. oh, I have to. Con- I didn't know that about you either. I mean, I've kind of been, I've kind of been um, in a bit of a hole for the last year. Or so I, but even when the Olympics came out, I wasn't quite. I got I got a little bit of understanding of who was following the Winter Olympics and who wasn't. But you're okay. I will take your word for it that there is a great overlap. Among the communities, and um, do you know why? Do you have a theory as, as to why? I'm so it seems to be, and I I think there are some men doing this as well, but it's it's um it's something about the the absolute totality of of figure skating. I think that you have to be there on the ice and very present, and yeah. I think of all of the physical disciplines that. Um, women in particular are inclined to get into some women do get into martial arts and other things, but most of us end up in, in physical disciplines that don't involve much peril. <laughs> well, and, you know, I've been skating, I, but I won't, you know, <laughs> I've been really lucky, but I I'm talking to fellow editors and writers and they're like, Oh yeah, I, you know, crack the top of this bone and the other. And they go back right back out there on the ice. And I think it's, um, an opportunity to have a really intense physical experience that otherwise doesn't happen. And especially for people who spend most of their times interacting with text and with thought and with, you know, your, your red or blue editing pencil, that it, it becomes a really, really grounded thing. Yeah, I completely agree. I, as research, as research, I took figure skating lessons and I took Kung Fu lessons and it was a revelation uh, for the reasons that you say. It's very intense, as lyrical as it is. Um, it's it's punishing. It's brutal, and injury is always injury is always waiting for you. And um, and it and it prevents it shuts down your ability to participate in the sport so quickly. Um, even the even the slightest injury, the, the uh, one wrong jump. In kung fu, and you're out for weeks, and so the I think the drama of it is partly what attracts storytellers. The drama of figure skating, especially the way that it's presented through um, through through uh, uh, news news coverage and Olympics coverage, yeah. it's all about the story. It's oh, all about the human feature yeah. story. It's all about the you know they're they're building up rivalries, and then the way that it's the way that it's judged is so is so brutal, but so dramatic. And it's all about, you know, waiting. You only get one shot every four years. And so there's this, this really, um, really, I keep, keep using the word brutal. This very brutal um, focus on age um, mm-hmm. and on performance in, you know, we know this is, two, this is a, the two minute program. Your last four years mean nothing if you blow these two minutes. So it's so dramatic. And I think that that might also be part of why a lot of storytellers are drawn to it. The 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 stories could not be more dramatic, and they're happening on uh, with the Olympics at least. They're happening on a, on on the 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 greatest, most visible stage possible. Well, but, and very high stakes. That's very, what it's very high like. Yeah. yeah. So I think that those are those are parts. Those are some things that uh, might account for the overlap between these two demographics. Um, but I mean that I, I one of the th- one of the things that really made me want to expand this world after I did the initial story and I and I did some research, one of the things that leapt out of it was a, a, a huge gift. Um, you know, I came into it. Uh, I came into into figure skating and kung fu classes with a fair amount of hubris because I was I figured I'm, I'm fit. I, I'm fit. <laughs> I'm um, and I come into it. And I look, you know, I just get scan the room and do this ridiculously arrogant um, sizing up of people based on how strong they look. And I very quickly learned that is completely irrelevant in figure skating. It's not about strength as much as it, as it is about 
balance and flexibility, neither of which I, I was particularly good at. And Oops. so um, yeah. I would I, I would be paired up with, with there was this one um, one very very um, very nice nineteen year old woman. You know, she's this little little um, live thing, and she would kick my butt every time we were paired together, and it was very very humbling. Um, as as an athlete, it was very humbling, but it was wonderful as a world builder because it helped me realize, okay, I'm writing about this sport, figure skating meets kung fu that rewards the way that women's bodies are different. Mm. And then so I rolled that back to the origin story of the city. That um, that because let me back up. This this, this is a, a story, a series of stories about a sport that combines figure skating with kung fu. And the city that the story takes place in primarily is made entirely of a substance that looks like ice, but is not ice. It's it's dry. It's not cold. It never melts. So um, they they can skate year round, but more importantly than that, the entire city is their rink. Um, they can skate on any rooftop, huh. any balustrade, any balcony. So there's an element of parkour in there as well. And mm, yeah. the, the origin story, is, uh, I thought, okay, well, that's a cool visual. That's going to that's gonna make for um, a, a great story. But why? Why did this happen? And that's where it became really meaningful for me. Um, I, I explored the backstory of this. And the backstory of it is that there is, there's this empire, the mainland empire of Xin, which is kind of China, but also very much not. And then there's this island of Pearl, which is kind of Taiwan, but also very much not. And then off floating around in the background is another large imperial power um, called Eda, which is kind of Japan, but also very much not. <clears throat> but there have been wars back and forth between these countries. And the result of it was that this little island of Pearl had um, its male pop population decimated. And because it was small to begin with, and it's fighting off these men, and they're just getting ground up in these wars, and so they're left with a tiny male population. And um, the, there's a young woman who escapes from the mainland of Shin, and, and she was a, a failed courtesan, and she was a dancer, um, and um, and she was sold into a family to be a courtesan, but she was just so small that um, no, nobody took her seriously. So she escaped to this island. And she teamed up with an, an older woman who was uh, um, famed for her ugliness. So she retreated to nice. the oceans outside, uh, off of the island of Pearl to live in isolation. Um, while she was there, this, this older woman discovered something in the water around the island. Um, and I won't go into any spoilers, but she discovered this substance that could be manipulated um, and turned into, turn into something like ice that wasn't ice. So they yes. built this entire city that you could skate upon, and the courtesan created this art form that combined figure skating with kung fu because they rewarded small, lithe bodies. And in the process, they were able to create an art form, uh, a sport that was a martial art with which the island could defend itself because they could draw upon all of the women left behind after the wars um, and not have to rely on the tiny male population that was left. So they took all these things that seemed like disadvantages. They took the fact <laughs> that this courtesan was this little thing that would never look like she would never grow up. They took the fact that this woman was was an outcast because she felt she was too ugly to live in society and she banished herself to the sea where she discovered this valuable thing. They took the fact that this island was filled with women and very few men. All of these scenes, things seemed on their face to be disadvantages and they flip them upside down. Oh, I'm getting emotional. They flip them upside down and turn them into huge strengths. And so that's what the book is very much is about. It's about turning something upside down because you can't read you can't read a character upside down. You can't even read a human face upside down. You can you could look at Angelina Jolie's face upside down and you you wouldn't be able to tell is this a, a an attractive person or not. All of those things that are, are, are illegible upside down because we are trained to be so sensitive to particular cues. And it's the same way with our disadvantages. We, are, we have lived our whole lives being told that something is a disadvantage, the way that our bodies are shaped, the fact that we're a particular gender, all these things. But we need to just 
turn them upside down to see the beauty that they are and the strengths that they are. And that's what this book is very much about, how this world turned all these things into huge advantages and was able to protect themselves <clears throat> because of those things that they thought were disadvantages. Okay. So, is your not ice slippery? It is, but it, but, but it's, um, I guess what uh, I'm asking is if you're not wearing skates, is it, Yes, slippery it the is, way if you go on so the entire CD is basically free of wheels or shoes. Everybody is on is on blades. Um, yeah, so it's um it seems like it seems like an inconvenient world, but to them, they think of having to walk around, having to push things, um, drag things as just being unbearably barbaric and primitive. So it's a matter of perspective. Uh, what, we, what we know is is what we believe, um, and be, because everybody has grown up on skates, learning to skate as soon as they can walk, and um, and being able to conserve energy so well, it seems like the natural sure. way to be. And it's and any other you know, like like with anybody else, they are fairly xenophobic. They see they see they see the rest of the world as being barbaric uh, because they haven't figured this out yet, and um, and maybe they've got something there. So I got a martial arts question because I come yeah. at it from that side. Um, if you're doing kung fu and you have blades on your feet and you're kicking people, um, there's an issue unless you're in a war. And it's a war, it's an advantage. But right. if you're just doing it as a sport, um, that could result in some injuries. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. That's um, that's what makes this school story interesting because there is always – there is always the threat of real danger, and there are many, many rules. I like rules. I think rules are interesting because they give you things to press against, and they make the characters exercise their muscles. So, so the school is just girdled all around with rules, in part to prevent injury. Um, doing any sort of uh, the art form is called Wu Liu, which is um, it's the it means uh, Wu is is martial. Liu is is a uh, skate is is flow. Um, it's it's a it's it's a um, portmanteau of Wu Shu and Liu Bing, which is um, right. um, martial arts and figure skating. So if you do Wu Liu outside of class, immediately there are, you get detention and demerits. And um, I mean, I love I love how Harry Potter was was so rich in all of these school rules. I, I went to a boarding school, and it was all about rules because. You have to you have to slap on all of these rules to keep kids uh, from from misbehaving when they don't have sufficient parental supervision. So one of the things that that defines a school is that you cannot do any of these moves outside of class, or your you you forfeit your next examination. Which means it's like it's like not being able to skate one of oh, the right. Olympics, and uh, and of course that happens, and it causes all sorts of drama. And then one student comes up with this radical way to make up for the fact that she fought outside of class and um and and needs to make up those points so yeah it is meant to be there is there is an element of very real danger because i wanted to I, when we when we do world building we have to establish our relationship with reality and i wanted something that was very very grounded for this world the first rule was no magic in the I love magic, but I wanted to make it very hard for myself. I wanted to create a fantasy world where there is no magic. Um, and I talked about, about this with George R. R. Martin a, as well. Um, he was a, a huge influence on me for the world building in, in this. But because I wanted there to be no magic, what ended up happening was the world ended up being very, very grounded. Everything was maybe an exaggeration or, um, or an, an, an uh, a romanticized embellishment, but it was grounded in actual practice and feasibility. And that included the martial arts, and that included the element of danger in the martial arts. So yes, there are, there's the constant threat of injury. There, is, there are a number of injuries, and they have devastating effects on the students, even when it's just a sprained wrist. One of the things that we explored, that I explored is, well, what happens to your balance? What happens to your sense of your body when, when, this, when even this, this part of your body cannot be used? Cliff, as a martial artist, you know that is, that's devastating. To not be able to use just a hand, you, you cannot compensate for that. You think you can compensate? There's no real way to compensate for it. You're just, you're just out until you feel better. And so that level of reality is in, this, is in the book. Um, even though it seems so outlandish, I was 
ground me in, in, in real world experience with injuries with Kung Fu. Um, I, I took a I took a bad leap board. Okay, so I, w I was doing this. Uh, I was in Kung Fu class and I was a beginner, but I was getting very frustrated because this young woman kept, you know, we would do, we would learn a, a, a new routine or a new kick and she would just go and execute it on the first shot. And I was getting very frustrated. So I thought, hell, I'm going to do this. It was, and it was, some, it was some sort of jump kick, a basic jump kick. <coughs> I managed to tear my terror, not, not, not to tear my hamstring. And within an hour, it was purple from um, a jump. It looked like somebody had, had cut me. Um, and um, and I, I always remember that, that, that there, the, the threat of injury is very real in these sports, and they're devastating to your performance. So that level of verisimilitude is in the books. Um, and it's actually really, really rich. When you have all of this danger around you, it creates a better story. ice skater as a teenager so uh -huh. i'm not hearing you and i've i've still got injuries oh yeah that, oh yeah uh, yeah i i tore up a knee when i was 12 and i kept on Ooh. skating for another couple years mm -hmm. and then i had it operated on but it's it's still no, completely no, trash no, yeah um these yeah, things no. these things remind you of your limitations and of the ambition that the sport yeah. requires of you and um again in the world building i wanted to embrace those things i didn't see them as hindrances to being able to do cool stuff i thought it just made you know there's a wonderful quote from susanna clark in john everybody's read has everybody read jonathan strange and mr norrell show of hands there's a wonderful quote from it that oh you can't you have to there's a wonderful quote from it <laughs> i think i own it <laughs> For Cat who has not read it, it's basically um, Jane Austen with magic. It's uh, this wonderful mimicry of um, Jane Austen manners and language. Nice. But one of the things, and, and it's, about, it's about this lost magical tradition in England that, um, that is unearthed and the sort of upheaval that it creates in polite parlor society when um, you can raise the dead. <laughs> what do you say to the, to, you know, to, to, to the comely young woman when she's just been raised from the dead? Uh, do you yeah, inquire about her health? And, and so the discomfort <laughs> that, um, that comes with magic being introduced to this very, very structured society is what the book's about. But one of the great things it does with the magic, magical system, there's a great quote in it that the author herself bandies about as a sort of thesis. And in, uh, the quote is from a character who dismisses magic. He says, oh, don't talk to me of magic. It's like everything else, filled with setbacks and disappointments. And that's how she made the magic feel real. It's so hard to get anything to go. Everything keeps going, just, going, just going this and just splitting off. And it's so hard to get anything to go in a straight line so that once something happens, it feels so earned and it feels so believable because you waited and you waited and waited for it to happen. So that's the approach that I took. I never forgot that piece of advice. Um, and uh, that's the approach that I took with the world building in this book. There are so many difficulties, um, including what, what Cliff brought up, the threat of injury, um, all, all, of these, all of these cultural landmines that the character has to navigate as she goes through her immigrant's journey. All these things were part of what made the world building Soar, I think. Uh, ultimately, when she does do something cool, uh, I, I think readers cheer because they they feel like they've earned it and she's earned it. So that was very very much a conscious uh, approach. All of these difficulties in trying to make something like this believe, make Kung Fu Figure Skating believable, were gifts, and they made the world building much more interesting for me to write. So I want to ask you. Um, <clears throat> What elements of the world uh, became deeper or, or, or arose in the interim between the two stories that you wrote, between the Ungrateful Daughters and the Peace Brat Chen? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, on, a, on the world building side, I worked on this story with George R. R. Martin as well, and he was so helpful. And he had specific advice for me. He was very supportive of one of the foundation stories that this that the book was based on. And I not, when I had 
because I had this opportunity to learn from him, I just I just peppered him with questions about world building, and um, and he gave me some great advice. One of them was that he said, "Look at the structures that have influenced your life today in the last twenty four hours. Um, how how um, how food is delivered, uh, money, insurance, housing, energy, all these things." you need to understand how these things work in the world. These mundane things will ground it. So one of the things he said to our class was, if pigs could fly, bacon would be very expensive. Uh, <laughs> the economic consequences of these world building choices are things that need to be explored because they help ground the reality of the more fantastic. Oops fantastical things putting okay. on some lights here that was one of the things that i worked on and that i ended up loving um the newspaper headline delivery system is one example of it mm -hmm. the idea of um, clocks um how they tell time how they and because this is a very structured environment how do they call students to class and how do they call them to meals and all these things and how do we how do we build those systems in a way that is not you know um a thoughtless default to how we in our world would do them. How would they build them with their resources, their technology, their aesthetic sensibility, all these things in the very, very mundane things such as how, how they tell time. Um, and I put so much time into that, in, into all of that. So there's a hundred page encyclopedia of information as many of you probably have as well, but a lot of that was so joyful to write the way that um, what happens at dusk, when um, when the um, when the sun goes down and people go home and the way that the that the rich go home versus the way that the poor go home the public transportation system how they um, pay for the public transportation system and how there's always a couple of kids in the back that um, that they didn't pay that that jumped that jumped fares and and how they feel and all those very mundane things were what I worked on from uh, in the time between that novelette and the novel. So that was one, one thing. Building out that world was a great joy because it was all the little things that made it so real. I mean, that world is more vivid. I'm, I'm not very socialized now. That world is more vivid to me than, I, than the world around me now. I'm pretty much a, a hermit. I, I see a, a live human being once every couple of days. So that world has become very real in part because of this exercise that George R. R. Martin um, set me on and that I obsess obsessed over and never got over building out the most mun mundane things in the world. I mean, how, do, what did their, what does, what does their, what did their glasses look like? Um, where are they manufactured? This is a city that has no agriculture, it has no green space. So what are the, uh, what are the distribution lines for all the things that they need? I mean, it sounds so tedious, but it ends up, ends up being so, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. Catch yeah, not at all. <laughs> so, Interesting. You've come to the right place, Henry. <laughs> okay. Oh, right. that's why I forget. I'm home. Um, yeah, I uh, but yeah, so those that was one big thing that I focused on. <clears throat> I also focused very much on. I I thought very hard about representation issues in the time between um, the original story and and the books because I knew that I wanted to write. A book about girl power and the original story was on a on, on a in a more rudimentary way it was about girl power because, because it was about girls fighting and kicking ass i mean yeah who doesn't like that but i wanted to i wanted to explore those dynamics you know in a way that um went beyond my existing knowledge of girls experience so I spent a lot of I spent a lot of time with my editor, who is a woman, and my uh, I mean my agent, who's a woman, and my editor, who is a Taiwanese woman, and we talked a lot about this, and it was enlightening. And one of the things that I wanted to explore is that <clears throat> I hate talking in generalizations, but I'm going to because it's an, it's an important process I went through. The idea that that women and girls are more relational is not universal. Um, mm. the, um, you know, the idea that, that, that women are always going to naturally form relationships 
with every other woman in the room. Not all women do that. Not all women want that. Um, yeah, maybe there are forces in various societies at various times that say, okay, establish your relationship quickly with with this other woman in the room. Figure out if they're your mentor, your next best friend, your arch nemesis, all, you know, all those things. But there are plenty of women that say, I don't choose to do that. I'm busy here. I don't have time or interest to that to do that if, if i choose to have a relationship with the other women in the room maybe that'll happen at some point but not all women are that way and so that was one of the things i thought very hard about because this main character of peace sprout she she does resist that and she i think explodes some tropes because of that she resists those relationships until and she's not ready for those relationships, for one thing. Um, and um, and so part of the arc of the book is to see her growth where she decides her own place in a world that is predominantly female. So that was one thing I worked, I thought a lot about for this book because I knew I was stepping far outside of my own experience. But I also, it was also very important to me for this book to be a thank you to the people that have inspired me and nurtured me as a writer and as a human being, almost all of whom have been women. So um, because this was intended to be my thank you to them, I needed to, I needed to do as much as I could to um, represent that experience realistically and with variety and complexity. So I spent a lot of time thinking about that. Cool. I'm I'm finding it really interesting that I've heard Henry name drop two white men who are prominent writers and the, <laughs> the woman he's talking about have been identified by role. Yes, okay, that's that's fair. It's all <laughs> it's because it's only because those two were the ones that um, were drawn to my story and um, and helped me with them. But the um, the editor, my editor, is a superstar in her own right now. Her name is Tiffany Liao. And um, she works at Hope. She just edited Children of Blood and Bone. Which oh, was yeah. Massive runaway success. And she's she, exploding everywhere. Yeah, yeah. She's a genius. She has taught me so much. Um, she's a genius with, with plotting and with, you know, her approach is really interesting. She, when, I, when, I, uh, when she, she acquired the book, the, she, was, she was an assistant editor at Penguin Random House. She, was, she didn't have the... Um, the position she has now. But her approach was very interesting. She didn't object to any of the any of the things that um, might make the book you know, less marketable. The fact that it was an all Asian world, wall to wall Asian cast, um, some LGBTQ stuff happening that I can't go into because it's kind of spoil spoilery. She has zero, zero problem with this. But part of, I think part of her approach was Let's make this a page turner so that people, even if they, even if they might resist this material, let's make it so that they can't stop reading. And that was a, that was a brilliant Trojan horse approach that, um, that I loved about her work. And, and, it's, and it's apparent in a lot of her works. I haven't finished reading Children of Blood and Bone, but from, from what, I, what I read, it's apparent in that she did... Um, another book called Empress of the Thousand Skies, which is fabulous uh, by, uh, by Rhoda Baleta. Um, and um, it's also the, very much the same approach. But so she's become, she has, in my opinion, her own style as an editor that's very distinct, as distinct as any writer's prose style. And mm. she left an indelible mark on not just this book, but on the writing. I'll never be able to look at the same way again, I, 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 writing the same way again because of her influence. So mm. she was a, a huge influence on me. Uh, Kelly Link was another, um, another inspiration who helped me with this book. And, um, you know, Kelly, I don't know if, if you're familiar with Kelly's work, but she works in literary fiction and in genre fiction and works in adult works and works in um, works for younger readers. And part of the thing that she was so, so instrumental to me um, about was the idea that genres are really kind of constructs and they, um, they're, the borders between them are very porous if you decide they're going to be. If you, if you decide that you can write across genres um, and you don't impose those things on your, yourself, 
you, you might find that you might find the world is not is not going to be as um, resistant to it as you might think. Um, that was her experience, at least. She's she's able to cross genres back and forth very fluidly, and I found that, found that very freeing. So yeah, Kelly was a was a great inspiration to say, yeah, you know, you can make you can make the language in this, even though this is a genre book for children, you can make the language as beautiful as you want it to to be. You can make the world building as um, obscure as you want it to be. You can make the psychological depths of the characters as gnarled as you want it to be. Don't dumb it down. So that was very freeing to me, and that's a gift that Kelly gave me. And they were they were probably two of the of the women uh, that were most influential in this book. And uh, but most of all was probably my agent Tina Dubois, who um, just plucked me out of nowhere and was so incredibly uh, loving um, about this world. She was not. Her role was not so much to sculpt it as to say, this is what's special about it. Do you not realize what's special about it? Because, I mean, for example, I'm a, I love world building. And I thought that the star of these books in, these, in this world was, was the world. And as we worked on draft after draft of it, she said, no, no, no. The star of this is the voice, the main character. And I thought, well, um, but the main characters, I mean, she's great. But, I mean, I, she's so close to me in flaws and in personality, it was kind of invisible to me, but she helped me understand that, she helped me to understand what the true strengths of my own work were. And uh, I have never looked at my own work in the same way um, uh, since. Um, she really changed my own understanding of my strengths. So those three women, Tiffany, Tiffany Liao, my editor, Tina Dubois, my agent, and Kelly Link, um, the author, they were the most instrumental women in sculpting this particular book. Um, and, and Kelly, too. I mean, she was also, she said something that she probably shouldn't have said. When she read the first three chapters, what she said was, there is not one misstep in what I have read so far. And, of course, there were missteps. And, of course, there were things that I could do better yeah. in it. But I mean, at that point, at that point, taking on, something that was a little bit intimidating for me. It was what I needed to hear, and it helped, it helped give me the boosters to pr progress to the next chapters. Cool. <laughs> well, it, it had something based on, on figure skating. That can you, you, can you um, speak closer to the mic, please, um, Sally? Oh, sorry. If, if you had something based on figure skating that didn't have LGBT people, it would break yeah. the right away. Oh yeah, there's a Saturday Night Live skit about <laughs> the, the, the heterosexual American figure skating team, and it's just you know, what you imagine it would be. Um, yeah, you know that's a that's an interesting the, element the, of, of of figure skating. I think in part again to go back to what I was talking about, it's a it's a sport that is so strenuous so grueling, so filled with peril, but one that emphasizes grace in the presentations mm -hmm. as much as strength. So it's kind of this very non-binary sport and you have to have both. You have to explore both to succeed. It's built into, this, into the scoring system. Um, and I think that that, that more than the, fa than the idea that it's, it naturally draws gay people because gender identity is not the same thing as sexual identity. I think the fact that the sport itself is um, is is drawn <clears throat> from these seemingly polar strengths is what draws a diversity of athletes, including um, uh, including a healthy representation of LGBTQ athletes. So yeah, I think I think it's, uh, I think it's how sports should be. I mean, I think I think um, when we look at when you talk about sports that are score based, like point based. Um, such as basketball, for example, you hear people, you hear fa fans of LeBron talking about his grace, um, talking about you know, the poetry of his movements. We, when we watch sports, we naturally appreciate that element, even if it's not officially part of the scoring system. So, I think that um, I think that sports allow people to express that appreciation for physical grace, even when it's not built into the actual scoring system. 
but because of the way figure skating is scored, it's um, it it is it it's kind of laid out a welcome map for LGBTQ athletes. I I had never thought of I figure skating is inherently queer, but I totally buy this now. <laughs> <laughs> I buy it too. <laughs> it's not inherently queer; it's inherently welcoming to all. Here we go. <laughs> well, I was going to say I think that people who are 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 less inclined to mix that sort of uh, perilous physicality and the the dance of it are more inclined to end up doing other physical activities as their disciplines mm -hmm. where you might be more inclined to just do a more combat based martial art or you might be inclined to just be doing endurance sports or or just being in in dance or something else and not necessarily doing it by strapping little metal blades to your feet and and risking f taking a really really slippery fall onto a very hard surface mm -hmm. Everybody else gets to do their gymnastics very padded initially. Mm -hmm. And um, mm. figure skaters start off, you do your, your baby jumps with nothing. And then as you get more advanced, you might be put up on a rig that actually will suspend you so that you learn how to do the more spectacular jumps with a little more support. Oh, but mm -hmm. um, that's a really advanced kind of thing. And yeah, I mean... I'm I'm right at that place where I'm being asked to do a bunny hop, and it's um, <laughs> I I've danced for years. I've downhill skied. I've climbed mountains. I've done all sorts of things. But man, just being asked to lift my skate a, a, an inch off of the ice, it's one of the scariest things I've ever done. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I've been on a boat in the middle of a tropical storm, and that wasn't scary. Yeah, <laughs> compared you to know, this. It's interesting. I never. I mean, I got to. I think. I I, I think I decided to. Um, quit right after I was able to do a bunny hop. I managed a, a snow plow, but um, I, I just got frustrated because, you know, when we're, t we're learning snow plows, I'm like, how, how, how can we do a hockey stop? So I'm trying to do a hockey stop. And of course, you can imagine how well that went. But one of the things that, um, that I never got over is how alien this felt, how, how counterintuitive this was. It never felt natural to me. It mm. felt like the most... It, the most arbitrary idea for a sport that anyone can come could come up with. This is mm. a joke, and um, so for somebody to be able to take that so far beyond uh, what I experienced was um, very very interesting because they were just from another planet to me. Because I never mm. never got over that feeling of how unnatural this felt. I I went indoor skydiving sometime recently, and I I learned how much I'd absorbed figure skating body idiom because I did the wrong things indoor skydiving because I was doing ice skating things because they were oh, teaching me how to do flat spins and, and other things. And I just went, Oh, that's interesting. I learned something about myself, but I see what you mean about I, I, one of the reasons I figure skate is because it reminds me how to be awkward, terribly, terribly, terribly awkward in a way that I don't often experience and it gives me more um, more of an insight into characters that are struggling with physicality in a way that I, I don't think I would have if I'd just gone with the various physical disciplines of, of affinity that I'd gone for before. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going downhill skiing, it all feels normal and wow, getting that same speed on ice skates, I, I feel like a baby giraffe. Yeah. <laughs> Constantly awkward in my everyday life. I'm not sure I need to make it worse. <laughs> um, but but the, you're, you're, you never know whether this is your sport, Tay. Hey? <laughs> you might get on skates and be like, where has this been all my life? <laughs> uh, no, because I mean, I can't even like roller skate because that is like. It's yeah, very That's a different that's skill. Very different. It's yeah, a very, very, very different skill. Is, yeah. I just, all these things just seem horrible and wobbly, and I just, I. I don't need to break anything more. <laughs> I've already broken true. plenty. Broken bones are definitely to be avoided. It's true. <laughs> well, I mean, here we are at, at about 30 seconds to five. Uh, oh, it just turned five. Uh, uh, that flew by. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun with Henry uh, Leanne. <laughs> so we got to title it, right? <laughs> um. Uh, but anyway, Henry, thank you. Uh, so any last minute questions, I guess, is, I guess is what we go to at this point. Um, Henry? Yeah. 
Are you having now gone through uh, skating lessons and Kung Fu lessons um, and, you know, obviously mentoring and your writing and all this, are you a substantially different person now than the person who started researching this book? And what, what do you think is going to go on further in your life? And, and how is that going to apply to your next book? And even if it's not in the same world, yeah, that's what are you a, writing next? <laughs> well, that's a really good question because um, this is my first novel. And I think, I think that many people live for decades thinking, okay, well, my life will finally start when X or Y happens and everything will be different. Then nothing has been different. It's completely the, it's been completely the same, and if there, if I am if I am a different person, the gradations of change are so gradual that uh, I I can't see them. Um, it's still hard. It's still uncomfortable. It's still a lot of work. It's still a great joy. I still love what I I, I love what I'm doing. I hate the promotional part of it. It's the promotional part of it is um, unending, always going to be there, never goes away, and um, always a distraction from the writing. And I'm always. I'm constantly doing things that are outside of my comfort zone and skill set. Um, uh, for for my opening, for my for my launch party, uh, there's a song that I wrote for the book. Uh, there's a, a New Year's song that I wrote for for the novel at the, at the academy that they only sing once a year, and so it becomes very meaningful by. Um, by the end of the of the series because they only sing it once a year, and I thought, well, you know, everybody hates songs in fantasy but when they say that they mean they hate lyrics well why don't i just write write an actual song and so i wrote this song <coughs> and i thought well i'm not going to i'm not going to do this on a piano and guitar if i'm going to do this it's got to have authentic instrumentation or an arrangement but yeah you know, i had never played an arhu or a, a pipa and so i had to do research about that and i'm not going to be able to learn it in a way that is convincing but i was able to learn the um apple Garage band suite of Chinese instruments to a point where it sounds convincing enough to people that actually can actually play the instrument. At least they've said that to me. Maybe they're being polite, but they they've said that it sounds pretty convincing. But then um, I wanted to perform it, to perform the song at my opening, and I had a, a great opportunity because uh, do you know who Adina Menzel is? Yeah. Uh, Adina is a um, is a, a great fan of the book, and um, I thought, well, I mean. She can sing. Here's a song. Well, maybe she'll sing it with me. And <laughs> she said yes. And <laughs> I'm, okay, so number one, um, I've, I've, I've written this song, and I'm going to sing it in, in, in front of, of people, but I'm going to sing with Edina Menzel. So, I mean, this is outside of my comfort zone, far outside my comfort zone. But uh, I also realized that we needed a visual because me just standing there looking like an idiot next to Adina Menzel is not going to work. So I got to do something. I got to figure out something to do with my hands. So I figure, okay, I can play the drum while, while, I'm, while I'm doing this. And um, I had never played the drum before. So I researched <laughs> taiko drums and I found a taiko drum um, uh, that I was able to rent. And um, because it was so expensive, I could only rent it the afternoon before the performance. So I was, I was learning how to drum nonstop for for 10 hours before and that was far outside of my comfort zone um but it came together i'll send if there's a way to send i'll send you a link to the video yeah, it came send me a link to the video um and i will make sure it appears with the report okay it's all right but yes Cliff, um, your you can also question, in the chat bar if you want to uh yeah well does it go away after our our thing you know send yeah it after i think it will go away but um, but Cliff, yes. Yeah, so your the question to your to your the answer to your question is no. It has not changed. Nothing has changed. I thought it would get easier. I thought I would be done with having to push myself. It has not changed. I don't think it ever changes. Oh, well, that's cool. If you're if you're not pushing yourself, you're not growing. Yeah, that's what I tell myself. <laughs> um. So what are you working on now? That's. I'm. Uh, I just finished the second book in the series, and and it, it's my favorite book of all time. Um, I was very cognizant of the fact that this is a second book, and second books are difficult. So I wanted to at least write. If I don't care about, I don't know what, what anybody else will think about it, but for me, it's my favorite second book in a series. Um, I pulled out all the Yay. stuff. I don't know if I have anything left in me. It's going to take some time to regenerate. So I've just. I just delivered 
the second book, um, and it's been accepted by my editor, Tiffany. She's very happy with it. So now I've got to recharge and think about book three. So that's where I'm at right now. Can we get a teaser on the title? Book two? Uh, what, okay, you, teaser on the title. The title is Peace Sprout Chen, Future Champion of the Battle Bands. Because it's all about rock okay. bands. Oh. Kung, Fu, Kung Fu figure skating rock bands and motorcycles, but motorcycles like you've never seen before. Really awesome. Who awesome. were you when I, was a, when I was a tween and needed this book? Oh, <laughs> it's never too late to have a happy childhood. <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> now. <laughs> okay, oh. there's another question that I talked over somewhere. Um, no, no, I'm just having a delighted moment of... of of Asian girl buckaroo bonsai moment. Woo! <laughs> I wrote it for you for for. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're, uh, we've run over a little bit, but I think that was definitely worth it. Um, Henry, thank you again for joining us, and um, I'm going to stop the broadcast. It's just been a real pleasure having you with us and learning about your book. Everybody, go buy it. Um, yeah, I don't actually, I think, I can't recall. We may have Kelly Robson on the show next week, um, which would be kind of amazing. Uh, so I need to reconfirm that, but um, I think that's what's happening next week. Uh, and on that note, I will stop the broadcast. All right. 